What was the last book you read? Was it on the New York Times bestseller list? Come on, be honest. Was it a mystery novel? Anybody? Yeah, some of you. How about sci-fi? Anything? A couple of you? <clears throat> was it a novel about truth and beauty in the face of oppression and injustice? <laughs> Show off. <laughs> Many of you know that I love movies and television. I just love that superhero stuff. The epic fantasies, the dystopias, the space operas. I'm there for the timeless themes, the hero of a thousand faces, the endless cycles of good and evil, and I just eat that stuff up with two spoons. But I don't read novels as much as I used to. I remember, though, happily chewing up days with my imaginary friends on some adventure or another. When I was younger, I was all about the epic fantasy, just like one of the Clark kids, right? I, that's what I did. <clears throat> I was all about, I liked the Lord of the Rings, that was one of my favorite, the Wheel of Time, the Belgariad, Earthsea, Pern, Xanth, Amber, the Rift War, Shannara, Dragonlance, Elric, Arthur, Fafford and the Grey Mauser, Thomas Covenant, the Riddle Master of Head. I had lots and lots of favorites. I just love books. But I want to ask you today about something slightly different. When was the last time you read a book about history? A couple of you. How about a biography? A couple more. Popularization maybe of science or technology. Something like that. Brian Greene's really good, by the way. Now, how about this? Have you do, ever dove into the mystery of how AI models work, the ethics of journalism, trends in world health, sex in the Middle Ages, string theory, the neurochemistry of addiction, the new data on human consciousness, the mystery cults of ancient Greece, pedigree collapse, what the heck is that? Sculpture in ancient Mesoamerica, the art of espionage in the 19th century. This is Fun stuff. Anybody done any of that type of stuff lately? A couple of you? Good for you. You can go have coffee now. <clears throat> <laughs> Just kidding. You're stuck in here with the rest of us. When I was in seminary, my brother-in-law called me on the phone. He wanted to uh, get the syllabi for the classes that I was taking. Uh, I, for the record, it was like 15 years separated between the time he went to seminary, and when I went to seminary, he is an Episcopal priest, after all, and I, I just really didn't know what the heck he wanted out of all of this UU stuff. But he said something interesting to me, He's, something that stayed with me. He said that working ministers are notorious for having great big libraries with publication dates that end with their own graduation date. Interesting. And while I certainly applaud him for trying to avoid that fate, I have often wondered how many of us, regardless of our curiosity, regardless of our educational background, regardless of our professional calling, I wonder if we don't do the same thing. We learn for a while and then we just stop. If this is true, and I suspect it might be for even most folks that consider themselves educated, I wonder if this is a new thing. Learn for a while and then just stop. I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest, that today the workday kind of never ends, does it? Email and text messages and direct messages, they arrive around the clock and our devices are all programmed to provoke us into accepting, reading, and responding to those messages around the clock. We have just-in-time delivery of news, bingeable programming a click away, and many of our social media platforms, well, all of them, they're designed to keep us scrolling, staring, and drooling at updates, fishing for likes, and hoping for that next funny cat video. Now, it's rare that you're going to find me pining for a simpler time. But I am reminded that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, date night 
whatever that was, would have included something other than Netflix and a bottle of wine. If we were feeling fancy, there may have been a play, a concert, or even the opera. That's very fancy. But once upon a time, it might have included a lecture. Long before Netflix and Blockbuster, there were people who would travel all over. And everywhere they'd stop, they'd give a lecture, charge a small fee, sell a few pamphlets, and then they were off to the next town. Lecturers could apparently make a decent living doing this. By 1834, there were some 3,000 locations all across the country where the bored and the curious could go to hear a debate, listen to a talk, engage with the big ideas of the day. Frederick Douglass, Henry David Thoreau, Daniel Webster, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Susan B. Anthony, and Ralph Waldo Emerson were very popular lecturers. Many of, you, uh, many of you have heard of something called the Lyceum Circuit. Anybody? The Lyceum Circuit? Uh, and the Chautauqua Movement that the circuit evolved into after the Civil War. And you know that these and others like them were the early end of a much larger and much needed shift in what was called then public education. But it is worth recalling why that reform was important and what was going on that made it so. In the 19th century, the school day was generally less than five hours long. The average school year, though, was less than uh, 50 days long. 50, just to keep you informed, it's 180 now. So my kids would have loved this. <clears throat> now, the primary pedagogical aim uh, of, of this teaching, of this learning, was to uh, familiarize kids with reading and basic math. These things were deemed necessary to be part of a modernizing, industrializing workforce. But beyond these basics, not much was required. Training in most trades was done inside the trade itself through an apprenticeship program, for example. In the mills and factories, it was all on-the-job training. Even though there wasn't much call for higher learning, by mid-century, illiteracy had nevertheless fallen to a, uh, an all-time low of 20% at that point. Most students, though, had dropped out long before high school. Over the course of that century, the average age that children started working full-time, however, also decreased from 10 to 8. The number of kids then completing all four years of high school was an altogether unsurprising 2%. 2%. College enrollment was substantially less. To put that in context, the work week at this time was six days long, with shifts averaging over 12 hours every day. This kind of schedule did just not leave a lot of time for philosophy, history, or natural science, and most Americans were never able to make that time. But Americans, being Americans, they found ways, and one of those ways was that Lyceum circuit. Another was church. For many in the more liberal traditions, church became a place where you could come hear something challenging, something new, something amazing. And that was why, maybe, sermons were a couple of hours long. During my credentialing process, I was asked, what from our past would I like to bring into our future? And I replied, the two-hour sermon. <laughs> I'm pretty sure only one of them fainted on the spot. <laughs> but that is why today I'll be talking until noon. <laughs> I'm kidding. Or am I? <laughs> now, there are lots of reasons behind the educational reforms of the 19th and 20th century. That's another day, another sermon. But it's interesting that change didn't start with kids. It started with adults wanting something more and attending lectures on this Lyceum circuit. I wrote about this for a paper during seminary, and that paper was in part the inspiration for today's sermon. Now, my paper uh, carries the extremely sexy title of 
self-culture in 19th century Unitarianism. You're enticed, I know, right? Now, aside from that small flaw, several, several people have come uh, and told me that the paper itself was, in point of fact, brilliantly argued. Those several people were all me. <laughs> I found that the idea of self-culture dates all the way back to the 16th century. Self-culture, you can think of it as the obligation of self-education. And perhaps surprising to no one here, this idea was really compelling to the founding figures of our Unitarian faith. William Ellery Channing, who arguably got us all started uh, by picking fights with his Harvard-trained contemporaries over the finer points of biblical scholarship, he wrote a rather lengthy defense of the benefits of self-culture in 1839 titled <clears throat> Self-Culture. Apparently, he and I share an editor. I'm tempted to paraphrase Channing's challenge this way. Think of your entire life as a flower sprouted from your truest nature. You are a seed given by God, a seed that it is your job to grow. Your life's work, your unique and peculiar purpose is to cultivate that seed, to grow God within you. Pretty cool. In 1880, Unitarian minister James Freeman Clark wrote a 450-page book on self-culture because, and I'll ask you to forgive the sexist quote, uh, sexist language, quote, he said, quote, man can educate himself. He can, by effort and thought, acquire knowledge, become accomplished, refine and purify his nature, develop his powers, strengthen his character. And because he can do this, he ought to do it, end quote. There's a reason, he says, for this, and he gives this as his reason, quote, each generation is born on a little higher, uh, yeah, a little higher plane of attainment in science, art, and social, social faculty than the generation that preceded it. But this social progress depends on individual progress. Every man who improves himself is aiding the progress of society. Everyone who stands still holds it back. The progress of society always commences in individual souls. You can sum it up this way, maybe. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, and it is our duty to honor those whom we stand on by lifting up even higher those who come after us. That seems pretty solid to me. And that brings me to the title of today's sermon. In his 1886 book, Vexed Questions in Theology, Clark lays out, quote, the, the, lays out the, quote, five points of a new theology, which he offered up as a counterpoint to the Calvinist the theology then prevailing in, in New England. Does anybody here remember the, uh, the acronym TULIP from your misbegotten youth? Yes, right. Okay. Do you remember what it was, TULIP? Do you remember, Jeff? Total depravity. Unconditional election. Limited atonement. Irresistible grace. And perseverance of the saints. Thank you, professors. Yeah, good stuff. Nothing like good indoctrination. Good stuff. <clears throat> so that's Tulip, and that's John Calvin. And for the record, even John Calvin thought his own theology was grim. Just <laughs> worth, no, worth knowing, right? Anyway, Clark, Clark offered up his own five points, and they're as follows. One, the fatherhood of God. Two, the brotherhood of man. Three, the leadership of Jesus. Four, salvation by character. And five, the progress of human development onward, upward, forever. That last point, the progress of human development, uh, we talked about that last March. You can check the YouTube archives for that. It's absolutely brilliant work. Everyone says so, and yes, I still mean me. Uh, someday, I'll go into what Clark meant by the first three points, but for this morning, I'll offer up uh, that, the, as a set, these defined Unitarianism. 
all the way up into the merger in 1961 with the Universalist Church of America. That is to say, Clark was extremely influential. But today, let's talk about that fourth point, that fourth point, salvation by character. And this is what Clark has to say about it. As long as we believe that heaven is something outward, to be attained by an act of profession or belief, we will be apt to postpone such preparation as long as possible. But when we apprehend the inflexible law of consequences and know that as we soweth, so shall we reap, when we see that spiritual tastes and habits are not to be formed in an hour, and that all formal professions, prayers, and sacraments avail nothing unless the heart is pure, the soul upright, and the life lived is one of integrity. Then a new motive will be added to increase the goodness of the world. Then the formation of character will be the fruit of Christian faith. Character. Character is how we save ourselves and save each other. But how do we develop character? Self-culture. These early Unitarians believed that self-culture was this process, process of expressing divinity, how we could live the sacred into our world by tending to ourselves, our inner selves, that infinitely rich soil from which is harvested a life of holy emulation with the goal of the perfection of our wisdom, our empathy, our understanding. The goal is to become ever more like God. Now, some of you may be thinking that this all sounds rather egocentric, perhaps even individualistic. We've talked about the sins of individualism before, even taken more than a few criticisms and complaints back to Emerson in that essay, Self-Reliance. And we've done that more than once because a church that aims at cultivating a bunch of elite, overeducated do-nothings is just not in keeping with the times, or so one might be tempted to say. And if you did say that or thought that, you would be very much in keeping with a great many of my current peers and current colleagues. After all, we are not a church that stands. We are a church that moves. Unitarian Universalism is not about right belief. It's all about right action. And if you were to say that all the interchange in the world isn't going to dismantle systems of oppression, which is something I lifted from Facebook like this week, <laughs> you might get a cheer, and this person did couple hundred likes from a great many of my peers. But I'll offer this, they're wrong. Because here's the thing, all there is, is you and me. On the one hand, we have biases in history. On the other, we have rules and procedures and laws. Systems, society, culture, those are abstractions. They're not demons and they're not magic. So if you want change, change the rules and procedures and laws. But if you want lasting change, you have to change the people. And for that, it may not end here, but it must start here. Start here. And it will lead you everywhere. To paraphrase the letter of James, while faith is without works is dead, we must remember that faith is first. <coughs> I like to think of it this way. Think of yourself as a cool pitcher of living water. If you are empty, you will not be much good to anyone you come across who may be thirsty. And I like to think that this is what my friend, Bonte Sujatha, what he means when he says that the world is too big for you to change, but you yourself, that is the perfect size. Self-culture. So this year, here is your mission, should you choose to accept it. Learn something, 
something new. And I don't mean only random facts, new vocabulary words, or whatever it is that will get you ahead in this week's game of Trivial Pursuit. I mean something big, something that stretches you, something that grows your soul. Keep exploring. Learn a new language. Learn how to make decent pottery. Learn the ins and outs of a new-to-you cuisine, not just a recipe or two, but dozens of them, all from one culture, and learn why they are important to that culture. Read a book, something off the nonfiction bestseller list, maybe, and then read five more on that same topic. And then find a way to teach someone what you've learned. Sign up for lifelong learning at Wabansi. Join the Geneva Learners, a Socrates Cafe, our Wednesday, Wednesday night Zen group. Lead a discussion group. Join all of the book clubs. Watch all of the documentaries. And never, ever stop telling everyone about all of the amazing things that they might not yet know. Get annoying about it. And feel free to blame me. And whatever you do, never ever let anyone ever tell you that education is about a job. That is a lie told to you by someone paid to keep you ignorant and small. While it is true that all of us were born ignorant, the only true ha job we have is to not remain that way. Self-cultivation is your birthright and your obligation. You were never meant to be small. Learning and education and growth is about you becoming what you were meant to become, human. A child of impossibility, reaching forever into infinity. That is you, and that remains true from the day you draw your first breath to the day you draw your last. You are more than clay, more than stardust. You are more than good intent and positive impact, more than justice, more than hope. You are a human being, and you have always had this power, this truth buried in you. You are more than your career more than your obligations, more than your biases, your histories, more than all of those expectations that you keep collecting. And it is out of you, out of each of you, that something beautiful can be grown. Can that save you? Yeah, I think it can. But either way, it'll be interesting. And maybe, maybe that's enough. Amen. Visit us at uusg.org.